Welcome, everyone. I'm very excited to be here. I don't know if I microphoned through the speakers. I doubt, I'm all, I doubt I am. I'm sure I'm only microphoned into the camera. My name is Jesse Parent, or Parent, if you want to be French and technical. I am a native of Massachusetts. I moved here to Utah around 1997 and have been here since. I am a performance poet. I am an improviser. I'm a professional speaker. I am also someone who is prone to having my imagination and creative processes blocked. I'm sure none of you understand that, uh, as you are all creatives who just thrive and are always producing ideas. Uh, anybody here ever encountered a blank screen or a blank page and just been really racked with doubt over what's going on, I agree with you. Um, so from the perspective of muses, we, we kind of touched on this with, with Paula's introduction. We're looking for something to inspire us, and it comes from the nine muses of Greek mythology, none of which, by the way, for any of you who are into the visual arts, is a visual artist muse. Uh, but we do have two for poetry, so yay. Uh, what we are looking at is folks throughout time have encountered the blank page, the blank tablet, the blank whatever you want, and have said, what am I going to do? How am I going to get divine inspiration to gift me with an idea that will surely last the ages and then I will be forever emblazoned in the imagination of youth forevermore who don't even speak the same language as I do? Surely there is something in heaven that is out there. And we want to romanticize the idea of having a muse, of having this divine spark. But the creative process is work. <laughs> And it's really hard work. It's trying to just cast out, get an idea on paper, judge the heck out of yourself, and say, this isn't good. Uh, this is crap. You will never be as good as the last thing that you produced. Why are you still doing this? I think everybody goes through that process. And I don't know how I can tell you how to get out of any blocks that you have, but what I'm going to try to do in this presentation is walk you through what my process is and show you a little bit of what has been produced by that process. So it's going to be a combination of a presentation and a performance. Who here has ever been to a poetry slam? What? <laughs> Where? <laughs> I don't see any of you in Salt Lake. Um, so a, for those of you that did, the, the five people that didn't raise their hands, uh, Poetry Slam works a little like this. Someone gets up on stage, they have a time limit because we want to keep them from going on forever. Uh, we usually give scorecards to judges who have never been to a Poetry Slam because that, that democratizes it, which is a word, uh, gives it back to the people. And the other part of it is that there's, a, there's other rules around it, but it has to be your work. And you're trying to impress people that have no idea what poetry is. Uh, but there is this misnomer about poetry readings and poetry slams. So if you've ever been to like a collegiate poetry slam, perhaps a page or, or a poetry reading, you're probably used to a lot of folks sitting on uncomfortable metal chairs with coffee in their hands, so like this back row. And they're just kind of like, okay, yes, uh, mm, rib cages, yes, uh, gossamer wings, wonderful. Uh, and you have a lot of time to play with the page of it. With poetry slam, it's instantaneous. I need to get a reaction. And sometimes you're, you're going out into this theatrical space and you don't know what's happening because you have a lot of people staring at you going, well, I'm not supposed to do anything. This is poetry. Let's be silent and respectful. Fuck that. All right. By the way, there's going to be some swearing, so if you're not prepared for that, uh, sorry. Um, some things that you can do, if you enjoy what you're hearing, you can snap. You can just go like, I enjoy this, but I don't want to interrupt what's going on, so I will simply do this. You can do that with me if you want. If you can't snap, just say snap silently. Snap, 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 snap. Go ahead, right now. Look, everybody's like, so like, should I? I don't know. This is a creative space. No, please, look, put up your hands. If you have coffee in your hand, just spill it. All right, very good. Um, you can also stomp your feet. Uh, if you are crossing your legs or on a couch with a, a footrest, you can do that. Uh, you can clap. That's okay, clapping, so fine. That's what's, you can laugh. You can laugh. But the other thing you can do is boo. Boo, I hate this, boo. Or if someone just says something really problematic, maybe misogynist, you, like, you can hiss, you can 
audience. And that's the fun for me of getting that immediate feedback from the audience. So please, I encourage you, do not be silent if you hear something that interests you, impacts you in some fashion. Uh, so I'm going to walk through my process just a little bit of finding my muse. There's this old saying, write what you know. Write what you know. Like, write, if you know something, go ahead and write it down. Which is kind of horse crap. You kind of have to write other things. You have to get outside of what you are and into another space that isn't you so that you can start to collect new ideas. So I say write what you research. Uh, I am also a comedic improviser and I tour around and we did a show in Nevada and we were at a rodeo which is a prime area for comedic improv. And I was wandering around and found myself in a tent that says, Cowboy Stuff. I said, what's Cowboy Stuff? And it's very tight jeans and cowboy hats. So it's like going to a hipster bar. Uh, but there also were belt buckles. And I started to look through the belt buckles and I'm like, oh yeah, my dad likes belt buckles. Maybe I can find something that he likes. And unfortunately, I think I did. <laughs> so, uh, yes. Uh, the, the, yeah, definitely. That is the right reaction. Um, I, so, so I took a picture of this going like, wow, a Confederate flag lined with iron German crosses. What a statement. I think I'm going to take a picture of this and put it on the Facebooks and say, look at this, friends. And I had a friend who was also a poet, so you think progressive, um, probably open-minded, but from the South, and said, well, are you one of those people that thinks Confederate flags are racist? And I said, yes. Yes, I am. I, maybe I'm missing something. May, I don't, help me out here. Let's have a conversation. And a friend of mine chimed in on the conversation and said, look, it doesn't matter what you believe a symbol means. Anytime that a group takes a symbol upon itself, it imbues the morals, uh, the, the, the very structure of that organization upon it. I'm like, that's a, that's a great way to put it. And I'm, I started to think about what other symbols throughout history have been sullied that are irredeemable. And I, what, what would you, as, as in your own mindset, what's a symbol that you think probably is irredeemable and will never come back? Yeah, swastikas. Uh, swastikas have been around for quite a while. I didn't know very much about swastikas other than, you know, it's a scary looking black uh, cross uh, that's angled on a, with a big white circle on a red background. And so I did research. I did about this much research for this much poem. And, but it was a fascinating experience to go through, like, what does it mean for different religions? And I don't know if you remember uh, back a while, uh, maybe 20 years ago, when Pokemon was really getting started, uh, the kids were importing uh, Pokemon cards that they couldn't get in America from other regions. And uh, this kid in New York got, opened up his pack from Thailand and discovered swastikas all over it. Well, because it's a very benign symbol in that region. And you have to remember that this is something that's been around for millennia, and this jerk, not even 100 years ago, came along and just completely destroyed it. And I started to think about what other symbols are starting to come into that same light. And I put together this, this poem uh, that I'm going to perform for you called Hook and Cross because that was one of the words that, or one of the, um, one of the things they use to describe a swastika is a hook and cross. And it's very universal because any basket weaving culture will dis discover this symbol. And I did the poem as just a straight poem. And people were like, okay, that's fine. I don't really, what's, and they would talk to me and ask me, well, what, what does it mean though? And I started to think about what, what I was trying to convey and that brought my theater back into my art and trying to say, like, how can I theatrically present this in a way that's clear or, or clarifies this, this message? So I'm going to perform this right now. Little brother, look what they've done for me. For millennia, I have woven myself into humanity's dreams, raised comet-like across a collective consciousness as basic as a circle, a hooked cross, a child of lines and busy hands, simple, recognizable, they call me swastika. And I was everywhere, 
even in the one place I wished I wasn't. No, I admit, I was jealous of you, little brother, and the star you rose up on, for I was just a hooked cross glossed over on cracked clay pots and deerskin teepees, hidden along with kisses on the collars of Chinese children, ironically, to protect them from evil spirits. All of Asia blended me into their backgrounds. Jainism, Buddhism, Hinduism, I could tell you where any temple was. A sun symbol, a heart seal, eternity. Minor celebrity on one continent. A child's absent doodle on the rest. He took me west, little brother. Told me to point right and lean, hold the pose, show the bright white spotlight on me. Well, I danced on a red carpet. They all waved at me, little brother. I got caught up in the rush to become a major celebrity. It was too late to turn back. They slaughtered each other under my hooked shadow, the smoke of their flesh darkening my form. I let them turn me into something horrible, simple, recognizable, detestable. Humanity's dreams no longer idly trace my form in innocent doodles. Countless millennia may never wash away the stench on my lines, no matter which way I turn. A minor celebrity on one continent, a symbol of hatred on the rest. So many killed while I waved over them. They're murderers justifying themselves by the meaning they put into my shape. They killed for me. Now you don't have my hooks, little brother. But we have the same parents, the same simplicity of lines. We have had different men who have defined us even if we have both been worn by popes. My body count is well over six million, little brother. Pray they do not start counting up the ones who were killed for you. Boy, I tell you, as a Catholic, that's a really tough poem for me to perform. It's a really hard inspection of the history of my own faith to say, you know what? We are on the cusp of turning this into something really dangerous. Uh, Never mind the Crusades, but let's talk about just like the modern genocide that's happening with our LGBTQ youth and in the uh, face of religion. That is uh, almost irredeemable, and we need to come back from that. So that was the thing that I was trying to convey, that simple switch um, and being able to call it a hook and cross the whole time and saying, okay, now you get it. You get this conversion. Uh, what's really weird is a lot of my Mormon friends love that poem. I don't really know why. Maybe it's like the symbology, uh, the, the absence of symbology. I'm not really sure. Uh, the other thing is writing what you love. Uh, we don't really go into that, our emotional values, very often when we create. Uh, we're trying to think of like the big thoughts, the big themes. What about like the big feels? the big wants, the big needs. So my poetry, my art, is driven by two things. Uh, My family and my religion. Uh, And my family is a bunch of weirdos, and my religion is also equally a bunch of weirdos. Um, There's uh, a poem that I have. It's kind of my free bird. I was joking about this. It, uh, there's a video of it on YouTube, and it's at like between four and five million hits. And um, it's really awkward going to poetry festivals because people come up all the time and say, oh, I love that. I'm like, yeah, that's all right. That's all right, poem. All right, yes. Uh, but what I wanted to do was take a trope, take something that was very accessible and turn it on its ear. And the tropes kind of allow you that accessibility, that invitation in. But really, I wrote this piece for the last two lines. So I'll I'll talk about it in just a second after I perform it. To the boys who may one day date my daughter, I have been waiting for you. Since before her birth, since before my spark took hold and ignited the fire in her mother's belly, I have been training to kill you. When you took your first steps, I was preparing to make it so you never walked again. When you played at war, I was perfecting headshots. You can't catch up at this point. And when you first see my daughter and fall in love with the look she sends over her shoulder, her crescent moon eyes framing her laughing smile, you are going to want to talk to her. 
And when the hours pass by like sprinters during that first timeless conversation, you will also know, with a deep and impending sense of dread, that you are going to have to talk to me when you first come to my home and see the bone carving over my threshold. Try not to imagine your own femurs, so expertly carved. Pay no attention to my ample crawl space, my room with a rubber mat and a drain. Be careful to only approach me with love for my daughter. See, I've been seeding her childhood with taproot hugs to weed out indifference and apathy. There will be no daddy issues for your teenage talons to latch upon if you break her heart. I will hear it snap with the ear I pressed against her mother's belly. The elbow I cradled her head in will send a message to my fist. My cheeks are attuned to her lips. I will know if she trembles. I have taught her that a man should never hit a woman. Now, my wife would really like to add that you really should never hit anybody, but I've taught her that a man should never hit a woman. Consider my genes a mark of Cain. You will suffer seven times whatever you do to her, and she will not keep your secrets. You can't make fire feel afraid. I have been teaching her love all her life, and all that I ask is that you continue the lesson, love her, Befriend her, protect her, be there when I can't. And when my body gives up to the grave, let the grin that eternity carves into my face be a reflection of the peace that your love brings to her. And we should get along just fine. <laughs> Addendum. To the girls who may one day date my daughter. <laughs> my wife is a better shot than I am. <laughs> Um, now, that last line is very important to me because I want this invitation, I want people fooled into the space, and I want to say, if you can believe this, for this heteronormative experience, what about any experience? What about any love? And it became very relevant uh, for this poem. <laughs> My daughter tells me she wants to start dating, and I shrug. She tells me the name of her girlfriend, and I shrug again. She tells me I need to be careful because her girlfriend's parents don't know that she's gay, and I pause. She tells me it's because her girlfriend's parents are religious, and I want to say, well, so am I, and that shouldn't matter, but I have to admit, well, religion doesn't always build the closet door. It does tend to supply the lumber to plane it straight. After all, Jesus was a carpenter's son, knows the many uses of wood, how to hang plum. And I have reached the point of parental dilemma where I need to be honest with this girlfriend's parents, but she just needs to survive. My daughter praying to cross timber on an atheist rosary that when she opens the door, her girlfriend will be where she left her alive and well hidden under a heap of clothes that her parents have bought for her. And I live a thousand lifetimes in this decade of Hail Marys where my daughter does not go to prom because her girlfriend has to go with a boy, where she is referred to as an aunt or a special friend, where she is dragged behind someone else's closet door, applying another layer of lacquer and varnish until she blurs a little more every day. So when I meet this girlfriend's parents I smile like a stack of toothpicks shake their hands to feel for calluses splinters but I choose their daughter's survival over the truth but I say a prayer a silent vow to take every door in my own home and feed it through a wood chipper until my daughter falls in love with the smell of sawdust. Um, that last poem came from when my daughter did start dating and uh, she was dating this young girl and she was closeted and came home with a hickey on her neck and I was like, come on, really? And she's like, what? You guys said not to care about what anybody thinks about me. I'm like, yes. However, here's what you've done. You've gone over to your girlfriend, whose parents do not know that she is gay, under the pretense of you are their friend, and you did not have a hickey, and you came home with one. <laughs> that puts that girl in danger. And either you need to stop dating closeted girls, or you need to encourage her to be honest. Um, and then her girlfriend cheated on her, and there was awful those tears. And, uh, but, but that's a different story. Um, the, the, but the whole idea of 
having someone else put you back in the closet was just like so anathema to what my wife and I believe uh, to our core uh, that it was, it was just troubling for me and I kind of needed to get that out. And that's where my love for my daughter, my religion comes into play. Um, and uh, you know, that's th these are the types of processes that I had to work through and tap into that emotional value. Um, right, what strikes you? There's a lot of weird shit in the world. In your everyday life, you are going to encounter something that is baffling, that is just odd, or that really, really amuses you for some reason. Great Clips recently came out with a, a series of commercials uh, where this guy from the West Wing goes around complaining about the fact that he can't get haircuts anymore because he is bald. I think that is hilarious. Um, I will take my children to great clips all the time because of this ad. Uh, and it's just wonderful. And it's weird because he's not a customer, obviously. He's just saying, you know, take care of yourself while you got it. And it's just, it's so hilarious to me, and it strikes me as so funny, and I'm just trying to think of the creative in the room that says, you know what would be great for our haircut place? A bald guy. Uh, I just, I, I really think that's a beautiful idea. And just thinking outside the box of like, how can you redirect the lens of your message through someone who may not represent what you're trying to communicate to is just so funny to me. Um, I, I, speaking of things that are funny to me, uh, I was having a, com a conversation on Twitters with uh, some friends of mine, and uh, these two women who were dating were talking about whether it was appropriate to fart in front of your partner. <laughs> and I'm like, of course it is. Like, what are you gonna do? Hold it in for eternity? What's going on right now? And uh, the, one of the women's like, you're just nasty, Jesse Parent. I'm like, whoa, let's talk about this. And, um, and so I started to think about what, what's involved in the idea of being around someone in their worst moments, whether it's emotionally or physically or even just like the annoying bits, like, you know, someone who chews their mouth uh, with their mouth open or, some, or something where you just have to, you love everything about this person, but here's the 1% that just drives you nuts. Um, and I came up with this poem. <laughs> I suppose you're wondering what we're doing here, under this comforter. Well, the truth is, darling, I am about to fart. Now, before you get angry or flail madly or hold your breath, just hear me out. I'm not going to pretend like this is going to be a walk in the rose garden, though. This is going to stink. It might smell like stale popcorn salted in asparagus, or a cabbage brownie, or something so Velcro and foul it clings to your pant legs like trash juice. I'm not a good judge of where these things are going to go. They call this the love test. Dutch ovens, hot boxing. This is how you know you have someone special. It's not about how when you kiss and fall into each other's lips, or how electricity conducts from each other's bodies when you touch your fingertips to each other, or what ancient languages you blur it out as you climax together. <laughs> Simultaneously. A relationship's best moments are fleeting flashes of perfect, the untenable hold of joy, and this is about those less than ideal moments, the times when we are simply human. A loosened booger, a trap door opening and closing with every breath, finding underwear in a trash can, and we don't say a word. <laughs> the conversations you have with each other while on the toilet, if you can't love me in this awkward space, just live in this filthy, stinking moment, what are you gonna do when it really gets bad? Can you still love me? Throwing up every hour, my bedside table, a heap of prescription bottles, my pillow, thatched with what little hair I have left to give, can you still love me? Showering me in a chair, wiping my ass as I sob, I'm sorry to you, throwing my underwear into a trash can without saying a word, can you still love me? When I struggle to recognize you, call our son by my brother's name, scream when I look into the mirror, my stroke addled face may hang like a sheet on a branch, wrinkled and absent of cohesion, just know that there are rings inside of me that are black and burned with the memory of you that I would carve away the bark of me to get at. We may not always be able to slow dance when our wedding song sneaks onto the radio. The doctor might tell me I won't live to see winter, that's okay, I hate shoveling anyway. And there may come a day when we are planning my funeral and I insist on being buried in the shirt that says insert wooden stake here over the heart. I hope you will shake your head and do it anyway. 
like I said, I'm not a good judge of where these things are going to go. Not everyone looks forward to being their lover's caretaker, and I, I'm not either. I just hope and pray that you will always love me as I do you in those difficult times. <laughs> like this one. <laughs> where we are both under a comforter, and I am about to... Is that you? Wow. Is it weird for me to say how much I love you in this moment for that? Just, yeah, like there's going to be weird stuff in your life. Lean into weird. Uh, it's a very, it's a very important muse. It's a very important indicator of like something that you actually feel. Um, Right what's personal. I think we all go through experiences in our lives and we genuinely think we are the only people that have ever gone through this in our life. We think there's no way, no way, someone else has ever experienced, felt this specific thing in a way that I have. And I'm here to tell you you're wrong. I had a poem that I did for a friend of mine who was killed in the Great White Fire back in Rhode Island. And I did that at the Utah Arts Festival. And I had somebody come up to me and tell me I also lost a friend in that fire. And it was incredible connection. Incredible. And, and you're going to go through things that you, you might think are just no one else is going to get. And I invite you to write that, to draw that into whatever you're doing. Because the person who notices that weird thing that's just for you will become your best possible friend. You'll be like, we get each other uh, in these weird references. Uh, about three years ago, my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer, and I stopped writing. Could not figure out how to get back to it. My life was consumed with taking care of her, taking care of our kids, trying to figure out how to channel my aggression through weightlifting and a lot of whiskey. And there were moments that we went through that were just ridiculous inside that experience. Um, and let, let, me, let me do this poem and we'll, we'll kind of talk about this. I have to warn you that there is, some, there is some swearing because that's how my wife processes. After my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer, I put on a shirt that had been folded for months, fallow and dusty in my closet, and I pulled out a long chestnut brown hair from a jagged seam. See, my wife has always had long hair. That waist-length librarian straight loomed down her back. She was feast, and I, famine. Our friends would often say her long hair is what defined her along with her smile. When my wife found out her tumor was malignant, she called it her asshole, which shocked our church friends. She said she wanted her asshole removed, which confused the proctologist, but she embraced pruning as a means of growth, survival. We had to tell our children that my wife had breast cancer, my son held it together, made it into math, my daughter shattered like a slipped and soapy plate, but my youngest, the eight-year-old, went silent as sleep, eyes wide and wet, and in a voice like Jesus, young and in the temple wise, he asked his mother, will you survive? And I broke, an oak giving up to the storm, but my wife, she weathered and replied, I'll try. No promise, just an exercise of her will behind a wet smile and she fights like only she can, takes on chemotherapy in a pink feather boa with a fuck cancer shirt on, tells her oncologist to hollow her out, to ball her like a melon and she will fight to stay the greenest rind, to plane her straight, take every lump and soft part of her. She will be so much woman without it, vows to be bald and breathless but still alive, hallelujah, still alive, evicting this asshole from her body and I remember all of this as I look at that long brown hair I have excavated from my shirt from a time when pants, cancer was something other people got when assholes were simply things that shit and cut me off in traffic and I hold that thin strand over the trash can 
and I let go. I go downstairs to cuddle with my wife on the couch, kiss her on her bald head, and she manages a smile that is weak, but still her, still there, still the part that always mattered. And when we put our bald heads together, it looks kind of like a butt, <laughs> except there is no asshole. Um, by the way, uh, that is my wife, and that is the pink feather boa and the fuck cancer shirt. Um, and, and she, yeah, and, and you know what? She is cancer free, has been for the last couple years, and we are through that. So that's, that's the addendum for that one. So thank you. Um, the last point I want to make is to just write. Um, we get into this mode of like, I've got to have everything going on. I have the candles, I have the music set to KC, PCW. I got, I got a pledge drive going on. It's really messing up my thing. Uh, we have to kind of get through those. Creative processes work. This isn't just like, I'm going to, oh, well, nice drawings. Are you doing some more of the arts? Uh, it's, it's real work, and you have to get there, and you have to take yourself out of your comfort zone. You have to figure out, well, what do I do to expose myself? You know, and like Paula said, coming to events like this are wonderful because you're going to get exposed to other artists. Please talk to each other. Please connect with each other. You're going to find out some really ridiculous uh, synergies and connections. I, I, I've been talking to Jessica, and uh, we've been talking about our past as software engineers and as creatives and as people who are trying to solve problems, and it's just been, it's been a wonderful conversation. Um, what I like to do is I like to join challenges. I like to feel stupid, do something that makes me feel stupid every now and again. So I'll, I've, I've taken welding classes and blacksmithing classes. Uh, I just finished a sewing class. I'm not good at any of those, but I, I at least am exposed to them and I'm, I'm having fun. I actually really liked welding quite a bit and so does my wife. And so we've, we're kind of like getting into like a lot of welding equipment. In the poetry world, we have uh, 30 poems in 30 days. It's usually done in April during National Poetry Writing Month. Uh, there are great challenges that come from there, especially if you share with other people and get feedback. Uh, that's the other thing, it's like seeking feedback. There's NaPoRimo, which, or Na, oh no, Na, NaNoWriMo, which is in November. It's National Novel Writing Month, where you just commit yourself to writing 5,000 words a day. And they don't have to be good, you just have done it. Or I can't remember how many words. I, I just kept, 5,000, that's ridiculous. I'm like, ah, uh, you're probably right. I don't know. I, I probably need more research. Um, uh, there's also a friend of mine, Chris Bodley, he does a drawing uh, challenge called 31 Days of Halloween where he'll say, okay, here are, here are the things you're going to do. On the first, you're going to do a ghost. On the second, you're going to do a Frankenstein's monster, and et cetera, et cetera. And it's just a way to just sit down, draw something, get that maybe is not your work. Um, the other thing is to just be mindful. Be mindful about what you're doing, and you're, you might be exposed to quite a bit. I, a lot of times when I'm, uh, I, I, I was bringing up religion, a lot of times I'm at church and I'm like, wow, that's, that is kind of a weird thing. Why did, why did Lazarus get raised after four days and Jesus was only three? Was there something weird about that? Like, did he smell? He, it says in the Bible he smelled. Maybe you don't smell after three days. I don't know. Um, and uh, also joining meetups like this. You can, there are a lot of things on meetup.com where you can get into everything, including I just joined uh, the meetup group uh, Slam Poetry Sucks, because I'm really interested to like, hear why, because if I can find out you know, what people hate about slam poetry, maybe I can do something to not do that thing that people hate. Um, so you know, the last things are, you know, don't judge yourself. I had a uh, slide up be here before with a judge like pointing at you. And uh, that's how I feel every time I sit down because when you do slam and you're constantly being judged, you're kind of writing and saying, oh, is this like an eight or a 10 poem? And you just have to like process and, and expose yourself to feedback, expose yourself to criti uh, criticism. And failing often, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of the phrase, uh, fucking up is how you learn. And that's just true in life. You have to go out and be unafraid to look stupid, do something wrong, uh, and then learn from it. Come back from it. And forgive others for when they're, they're screwing up. And the last one is embrace the suck, which comes out of the military. Uh, but my wife also uses it in her counseling. She's an addiction counselor. And it's about recognizing this situation is not ideal. 
what you're doing, what you're in right now is awful, and it sucks. Deal with it. How do we, pre how do we push forward? You can't just hide. You've got to go forward. And so dealing it with it can be your art. It can be the angry expression of, of what's not fair and what's in your life. Uh, speaking of the 30-30 challenge, I'm going to close uh, with this poem. It's something, well, a lot of times you're like, okay, I, I've got to come up with something, and you'll have uh, conducted challenges that say, okay, today, I, here's your prompt. It's like, oh, that's wonderful, that got me going, but a lot of times I deal with no prompts. And so, as an improviser, I like to kind of live in that space, and one day I was uh, trying to do a 30-30, and I said, What's, what could I write about? I'm like, I don't know, clowns. What's interesting about clowns? I don't know, they're kind of creepy. What if you don't know you're creepy? Oh, that'd be really interesting. So trigger warning, clowns. <laughs> Ta-da! Wasn't that great, kids? Did you enjoy the show? The part where so many of us exploded out the car door like toothpaste after your father stomps it with his shoe. Why all the shocked faces? You're not afraid of clowns, are you? <laughs> Fear of clowns, as if such a thing could exist. Who could be afraid of a clown? You, you, <gasps> don't cry. I'll make you a balloon animal, a horse, or maybe a dog. Mine never lose their shape. The trick is to twist their necks until just before they pop. <laughs> How about a magic trick? I know a few, mostly ones involving scarves and making things disappear. Have you seen the baggy clothes? They're so much bigger than they need to be. Why are they so big? They're hilarious. I could be hiding anything under here. Juggling balls, juggling clubs, machetes, anything. And have you seen my face, the red paint and my smile? Doesn't it remind you of apples, racing cars, sliced fingertips, and my eyes perfectly rounded in a blue you'd have to choke someone to see? And my gloves, whoa, aren't they funny? But they're not the real me. No, you're never going to lift a fingerprint from these. I'm a real person underneath all this silliness. Well, I could be anyone you've ever met, and you'd never know. Maybe after we're done, I'll slink back into Clown Alley, take off all my makeup, remove my fluffy wig, slip into clothes that fit like skin. Sit down right beside you. Wouldn't that be fun? See, I'm not so strange. My nose, it comes right off. Maybe yours does too. Ta-da! Um, yeah, that's it's a ridiculous point. So the important point there is don't be afraid to be a little ridiculous. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, thank you uh, for communicating with each other, for celebrating Creative Mornings. If you want to know more about me, my name is Jesse Parent. Uh, you can get me at jesseparent at Gmail. You can also find me at jesseparent.com, where I have books for sale, both eBooks and physical books. Uh, some other things, if you like Poetry Slam, if you liked what you saw, and all of you who raised your hands, I demand that you go. Uh, we are actually using, opening a new venue in the Gateway. Uh, with Washash Theater Company uh, this Monday. So we have Poetry Slams the last Monday of every month. We also have them on the second Thursdays at Watchtower Coffee, which is a comic book themed coffee shop uh, right near Salt Lake City Community College uh, on uh, 17th South and State. And uh, also you can follow our organization, Wasatch Wordsmiths, on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, etc. Thank you very much.